Okay. Um, last time we talked about heat intensity in watts per square centimeter on the surface of something, and we started to talk about uh, fusion welding. And by the heat intensity, I drew a little plot, watts per square centimeter down here at the bottom, going from 10 to the third up to 10 to the sixth. It turns out Below 10 to the third, metals would carry the heat away faster than you're putting it in, and above 10 to the sixth, they can't carry it away fast enough. And you can put on here every front, everywhere from high heat intensity proceeds, lasers, electron beams, down through arcs, and um, argon uh, uh, plasmas. This is an open arc. This is a welding plasma. This is a non transfer arc, which we'll talk about later. And then you have flames down in here, various types of flames. Um, now, if you look at the heat intensity, you can study it and say, well, the heating on the surface is going to determine the overall heating efficiency. How much heat just goes into preheating the base material and how much actually goes into melting the metal that you want. It'll determine the heat effective zone size. And I brought around, this has been passed around before, but I didn't emphasize the size of the heat effect zone. This is just a weld made down in an electric boat. On HY80, this is old. I've been had it for 20 years. But um, if you look, you'll see various well passes in here. But if you look to the side, you'll see the heat affected zone along the side. Okay? And that heat affected zone is on the order of maybe three millimeters in width, and it varies between maybe two and five millimeters on that particular sample. Um, but and we'll calculate later. I'll show you how you get to calculate that very quickly. Uh, the heat effect is on size for the low heat intensity processes, like if I was making what we call electro slag weld, which maybe I'll discuss later, I could have a one inch wide heat effect zone in the piece of steel. But even if I go to laser and electron beam, I probably, if I have a weld that size, I'd still have a heat effect zone that size. It doesn't get smaller all the time. Uh, the heat intensity also determines the travel speed. Higher heat intensity, I can go faster. It determines the need to automate. The equipment cost, the depth to width ratio, and the production volume requirements. This is all fundamental to the heat flow, uh, and the heat flow is controlled by the heat intensity. In fact, it's useful to recognize that the heat intensity is nothing more than the first law of heat conduction. Okay, Fourier's first law of heat conduction says Q is minus K dTdx. So that's the temperature gradient. So if I'm heating up the surface and I bring the surface to some temperature, I'll have heat flow in over time. So this is distance x and this is temperature. If I bring the surface to some temperature, the heat will flow in. Um, if you put in the units for thermal conductivity and um, the temperature gradient, you find that the Q we're talking about is just watts per square centimeter. Okay? The, the rate at which heat is flowing into the material is the heat intensity on the surface. And in fact, as you heat something up, that heat intensity will change as the thing heats up, that gradient becomes less. It's harder to heat something that's hot than it is to or put heat into something that's hot than it is to put something heat into something that's cold which leads to the uh, silly little question that people ask, does it take longer to uh, boil hot water or cold water? <coughs> you ever heard that question before? And what's the answer? If you start out hot, doesn't it make common sense that it will take less time to heat it up? However, what the confusion of people bringing up is they're not, they're not distinguishing the difference between temperature and heat. The two are not the same. One's measured in degrees, the other's measured in calories, or watts in this case. Uh, what they're talking about is if the thing is cold to begin with, the heat intensity is greater. The rate at which heat is flowing into cold weather, weather, water can flow it. Water is faster than the heat, the rate at which heat flows into a hot body. Why? Because delta T. Okay? 
If I have a bigger delta T, Q is greater. So the heat intensity on, on a, if I put a cold pan of water on the stove, the initial heating rate of the cold water is faster than the heating rate if I put hot water on the stove. I can transfer heat faster because my temperature difference is greater. But that doesn't mean that I actually reach an endpoint faster. Okay? If I start, you know, if I start running a race 10 miles behind the starting line, I probably won't beat the person who's at the start starting line when, when if we both start at the same time. <coughs> Mr. Or I okay. uh, anyway, so that's a common misconception, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, even engineers, not just lay people, often confuse the difference between heat and temperature. Okay, we're talking about heat intensity. Calories per second per square centimeter, if you want, watts per square centimeter, joules per second per square centimeter, and it determines all these things. Okay, the temperature of flames, we start talking about flames, which is the low end of this heat, heat intensity scale. Uh, the temperature of the flames is controlled by the enthalpy of the reaction, which is the heat of the reaction. Enthalpy is just another word for heat. Uh, the oxygen fuel ratio, which is also known as the stoichiometry of the reaction and the presence of inerts. Do I have nitrogen around? Do I have excess fuel? Do I have excess air, oxygen? Because if it's not reacting, it's got to be carried along and heated up with everything else in the gas. And so whether it's nitrogen, which doesn't burn, or whether it's oxygen that doesn't burn because I'm lean, or whether it's fuel that doesn't burn because I'm rich, it's going to have to be carried along and the, the, the molecules that are reacting have to carry along all their neighbors. And I made that uh, nasty social comment about welfare. Okay? Hopefully to help you remember. Okay? Not that I'm opposed to welfare. Okay. okay. Uh, it turns out the combustion intensity, if you go to the flame literature, the combustion intensity, or sometimes called the combustion index, so you just call it CI because index and intensity, both give, they give by, is equal to, in very simplistic terms, the heating value of the gas times the gas velocity. All that's saying is, if I have something that has a certain amount of heat, and I carry it to the surface very quickly, I'm going to carry more heat to the surface than if I carry it very slowly. So I just think of it as, if I, well, you can think of it if you want to think of um, ping pong balls shot out of the gun, the faster I shoot the balls out, the faster I fill up the, uh, the thing with whatever it is. Well, if I'm talking about heat, the faster I bring the heat to the surface, the greater the intensity of the heat, the greater the heat that each molecule brings, the greater the intensity of the heat that's brought to the surface. Okay? Um, now, um, it turns out that if I go back to think about different types of burners or heaters, heating torches and, and things, you can basically divide <coughs> the different types of torches into three types of flames. Three, right? Three, three. Uh, okay, the fuse flame is <coughs> basically your fireplace. In a fireplace, you have fuel and oxygen coming together, but in an uncontrolled way. You just put the log in the fire, the air, the, the air from the living room, you know, goes into the, uh, the, the uh, fireplace and eventually goes up the chimney. But there's no way that you're controlling the stoichiometry of that reaction. And in fact, you know that that flame is a oxygen starved flame in general. You might know why you know it's an oxygen starved flame? Yeah. It's because you're not burning out all the carbon. You're not burning out all the carbon. But another way, have you ever seen what a blacksmith does when he wants to heat, heat up his, uh, his forge? What's he do? He blows on it. He takes a bellows and blows on it. If you're, on a, you're, on a, you're out camping and you're trying to get a fire started, and you get the first little thing, you blow on it, right? What are you doing? You're adding oxygen. It's oxygen starved, so if you add more oxygen, it'll burn quicker. Right? All right? 
smoke. And the cause of smoke. Very good point. Um, we're going to talk a little bit, since it's a uh, popular topic now, about the World Trade Center. Was that an oxygen, was that a fuel rich or a lean burning fire? It's obviously fuel rich. I had a 10,000 gallon Molotov cocktail on those floors, right? So there's plenty of fuel there. But in fact, what was the color of the, of the smoke? Black. And what was in the smoke that turned it black? Soot. Left unburned fuel. Unburned carbon, to get back to, uh, to your point. If you have excess carbon, in this case, and not enough oxygen to burn it, then you're going to end up with a fuel-rich flame. That means it's not burning at soap down tree. And all this garbage that people say the steel melted, okay? I cannot melt steel in a diffuse flame. I have nothing to control the stoichiometry. Steel melts at 2600 degrees Fahrenheit. The steel got hot, and I wouldn't have been pointed to be standing there in the middle of that floor, okay? Uh, it got to probably 12, 1300 degrees Fahrenheit. A normal house fire will get to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, unless you got a good draft, okay? In fact, firemen come along initially and they often ventilate a fire to, to control it, but actually ventilating it actually increases the burning velocity but they're controlling it going in the direction they want it to go, okay? Uh, in ventilating a fire. So there is no way that without controlling the ratio of fuel and oxygen that you can get up to temperatures, uh, the, the temperatures that you have the capability because you don't have a way to control the amount of inerts. And typically you, you won't get to higher temperatures. It's the same type of thing of, when I try to explain it, and this is kind of the difference between temperature and heat. If I throw two logs on the fire in my fireplace, I don't double the temperature, right? That's ridiculous. It might be a little bit bigger fire and so the temperature might go up 50 or 100 degrees, but I'm still oxygen starved. And unless I blow on it harder, I'm not gonna get significantly hotter. What, happen what happens if I do add the second log to the fire? It might get a little bit bigger in size, but more importantly, it burns longer, right? So it kind of is kind of common sense. You add twice as much fuel, you put a second log on the fire, hopefully it burns about twice as long. It doesn't burn quite twice as long because it burns a little bit bigger and longer. Okay, that's a little trade-off there. So, and it burns a little hotter, but it doesn't double the temperature. Let's face it, if I wanted to do that, I could get infinite temperatures if I just keep throwing logs on the fire like they do in Texas A&M, right? Okay. No, no, no. Okay. Um, the uh, diffuse flame, because everything's got to diffuse and mix together, has relatively low burning velocities, and the velocities are going to be on the order of 0 0.1. Uh, and you can vary a lot, but let's just say it's going to be less than a meter per second. Well, look, just look at the flames in your fireplace. You can see them move around, right? If it's going faster than a meter per second, you'd have a hard time following uh, the trajectory of particles. Think of some light thing. Uh, I burn uh, paper at Christmas time in the fireplace, so that's all the living room floor. Um, and you, you see some light, sooty particle just kind of wisping up there, right? You can see it. Uh, it's less than a meter per second. Now, what's of more interest to us would be a premixed flame. Um, in a premixed flame, you take the fuel and the oxidant and you mix it in a chamber and then you have the two unburned exiting and you ignite out here. So you have your ignition. Okay, you have your ignition out here. Um, and that will give you something on the order of a meter per second. Well, if I have a meter per second, and I go back to this fundamental equation up here, that's going to give me a higher combustion index. Now, it might even be 10 meters a second. It depends on the chamber and the fuel and the enthalpy and everything else. But order of magnitude, it can be several order of magnitudes around this, just like this can be plus or minus an order of magnitude, depending on how things go. Um, 
but this is burning at constant pressure. Okay, I'm burning out here in the atmosphere, one atmosphere of pressure. You know, I'm doing PDV work as the gas heats up and burns. I'm doing PDV work against the atmosphere. That's a constant pressure process. I can go to a constant volume process, which is a jet burner, where I put the fuel and the oxygen in, I mix it in the chamber, and I ignite it inside the chamber. So a jet burner is ignition at constant volume. And what happens there? Well, now, instead of cold gas coming out, the gas flow out of this is just controlled by the pressure of these two coming in. Right? The gas flow here is not just the pressure of these two, it's the enthalpy of this reaction, because I've got all this expansion, or it's trying to expand at constant volume, which you can't do, except it can out of the hole, so it all comes shooting out of the hole at very high velocities, and I can get up to 100 meters per second, uh, typically, order of magnitude, out of a jet burner. Now, why do we call it a jet burner? Well, it's the same type of thing that occurs in a jet engine. I got a little combustion chamber, and I ignite it in the combustion chamber, and it all shoots out the back of the engine. Okay, and if it's a, if it's a, just a simple jet, uh, like a scramjet, all that is just pushing the thing forward. If it's a stationary turbine, I'm using that, those high velocity gases to spin the, uh, spin the turbine. Okay, so this thing shoots out at extremely high velocity. So those are the three types. This one's not too much interest to us in welding. And this one's not much interest, but premixed obviously is. Uh, and I'll give you an example of premixed uh, demonstration in a second. So it turns out the types of heat intensities I can get also depend on the oxygen fuel ratio and the presence of inerts. If I do, if my oxidant is air, I'm bringing along 40%, or not 40%, but uh, uh, Eighty percent uh, of my of my uh, oxidant is just inert, and that significantly reduces the temperature. So I may have, if I had pure pure oxygen here, I would get um, I, don't, I get higher temperatures. Higher temperatures mean higher velocities. And it turns out, if you think about it, this C H, the enthalpy of the reaction is going to be proportional to the temperature. And the velocity is also going to be proportional to the temperature. So the combustion intensity to a first approximation is proportional to the temperature squared of the flame. I want to get hotter and hotter flames. So if I'm going to build a rocket, I want to have something that has the greatest possible enthalpy of reaction, give me the highest temperature. And that will give me the, also give me the highest velocity, and it kind of goes as the square of temperature. We'll go through that in just a second, too. Um, and expand on that as far as that goes. Now, um, if I go through and figure out a theoretical combustion index or combustion intensity for a premixed pre flame, it turns out that if I actually measure out here the, now let's say I put a plate out here and I put some water behind it and I measure the rate of heating of the water. So I built a little calorimeter so I can measure the heat transfer to the solid plate and the water behind the solid plate. I just measure the temperature rise of the water and I know what the, the heat capacity of the water is and so I basically can calculate the rate at which I'm transferring calories or joules um, and the rate of transfer of calories and joules is watts. I can measure the watts on the surface of that plate because of that plane. If I do that, the measured value is 10 to 50 times less than what I calculate theoretically by plugging in the numbers <laughs> over here. If I say I'm burning methane, natural gas, CH4, and it has a certain enthalpy, I look it up in my thermodynamic tables, and I know how many pounds of methane I'm burning per second, and that will give me the number of calories in the methane. I know how fast this is coming to it, you know, the rate at which I'm feeding it, and I say, okay, what, how much of that is actually reaching the surface and heating up the plate? It's 10 to 50 times less than the total amount of heat, which means I'm wasting 
between 90 and 98 percent of my total heat. Or another way to say it is that flame is only 2 to 10 percent efficient. Following and how I'm throwing all those numbers around. If it's 10 times less, that's only that's 90 percent inefficient. I'm only transferring 10 percent of my total heat. If it's 50 times less, I'm only transferring 2 percent of my heat to the surface and I'm wasting 98 percent of the heat somewhere else. Anybody know the reason why? Have you read far enough ahead in that little 30 page thing? I haven't read anything. You didn't remember? You slept through it. Okay. Uh, doesn't matter. That's why you come to class, right? Tell you about it. It's because of the boundary layer. If this is my flame, and it doesn't matter whether it's premixed or any other type, I'm going to, if the gas comes in and hits the surface, you end up forming a gas boundary layer as the gas flows. It has to, this is solid down here, right? The gas can't flow through the solid, so it has to shoot off to the side. When it shoots off to the side, we know that a moving gas against a solid object forms something called a gas boundary layer. Anybody not studied boundary layers in some other course? So I don't have to explain boundary layers to you, right? There's a gas boundary layer. Well, the gas boundary layer doesn't, the gas doesn't move as fast. In fact, the typical kind of plot in your books on boundary layers shows that the velocity, they have a free stream velocity of the gas up here, but down in here, the velocity drops to zero, right? If the, if the gas here is moving less fast, it's going to transfer some of this heat, it's going to be cooler, and I have to I have a thermal boundary layer across here. And that thermal boundary layer, you basically got an insulating layer of gas across that surface. So yeah, I may be bringing 100 watts per, uh, per square centimeter to the surface, but I'm only going to transfer to the solid somewhere between 2 and 10 watts per square centimeter because of the gas boundary layer. Flames can be very inefficient because of the gas boundary layer. And that, if you go back and look at the numbers on efficiency that I threw out before, even for the best premixed flames, even when you go to the gas that we have that has the highest enthalpy, the common gas that has the highest enthalpy, which is acetylene, it's the triply bonded carbon and two hydrogens, right? Even you go to the highest enthalpy, and you premix it, and you use pure oxygen, you can't get more than about a thousand watts per square centimeter. It's about 90% efficient, or 10% efficient, 90% inefficient. You're actually going to be using, you know, 10,000 watts of energy per second hitting that surface per square centimeter, but you're only going to be getting into the, the metal about a thousand. So what's happening to the other 90%? You're just heating up the guy who's doing the welding, okay? And it's not the most comfortable thing if you're in a closed uh, space, particularly if it's really closed and you suffocate, but no, that's another problem. Anyway, so there's a gas boundary layer that limits the heat transfer. Uh, what else do you want to talk about? I don't need any of that. Um, it turns out that the between the, with this kind of squared uh, law, if I use pure oxygen versus air, I can get about a tenfold increase in the combustion intensity. And that means that an oxyacetylene torch would provide about ten times the heat intensity of an oxy or a air acetylene torch. Well, if I go back to what this guy, I gave you a paper by Strasino and Anderson. This came from Anderson, uh, lectures he gave here back in the late 70s. Uh, Anderson was a MIT grad, went to work for Union Carbide and uh, studied flames and published the paper that I gave you. But in any case, an air methane post burning flame, post burning means it's a pre mixed flame, it's burning after the mixing chamber. He shows is 100 watts per square centimeter, and oxygen acetylene post burning flame, he shows is 1,000 watts per square centimeter. There's an order of magnitude difference because I don't have the inerts. Well, the inerts don't drop the temperature by a factor of 10. They might drop the temperature by a factor of 2.5 or 3, but they also drop the gas velocity by the same amount. 
So I would square two and a half or I would square three, I get about a factor of 10 reduction in the heat intensity because of those inerts. So um, I have to use oxy fuel flames. Now, um, the enthalpy of the reaction does make a difference in all these things. And to give you that demonstration, we can use two different fuels. I just happen to have two different fuels here with me. This is propane. And propane, anybody know the formula of propane? C3HA. C3HA. Okay. okay, so. Propane is C3H8. And this other gas has a trademark of MAP, okay, M-A-P-P, -P. which, anybody know what MAP stands for? Methyl acetylene, propylene, propylene, or something like that. Methyl acetylene, right. <laughs> Propodyne. acetylene. Well, I know that acetylene is two carbons with a triple bond, right? And methyl acetylene is just the same thing with a methyl group on the end. So that's methyl acetylene. There's the acetylene, and here's the methyl group right here. And if I add that up, that's C3H4. Now, what's propodyne? Well, propodyne is just three doubly bonded carbons in a row with four hydrogens to fill out the bonding on the carbons. And what's the formula of that? It's C3H4. <coughs> so it turns out MAP gas is just a mixture of these two things, which basically have the same carbons and hydrogens. This one has two double bonds. That has a triple bond and a single bond between the three carbons. So it's called MAP gas. And it's got a little registered trademark. Uh, what does it say on here? MAP, and you can barely see it with his little R up there. Okay? Now, it turns out, which one do you think burns hotter, carbon or hydrogen? Right, anybody else want to take it? How many people think hydrogen? Two, three voted, four voted, five, six, seven. How many think people think carbon? No one else voting. Okay. Turns out it's carbon. Sort of counterintuitive. You think of hydrogen burning faster or hotter because the hydrogen is already a vapor. In order to burn carbon or a solid, you have to vaporize it first. How does a candle burn? If the, if the solid burned, you better not light the candle because the whole thing will explode. When you reason you light a candle and it only burns in one spot, you'd have a little wick that control keeps the flame there, and the heat from the flame vaporizes this little pool of liquid wax, and it's the vapor that burns. Why is it vapor and um, the the fuel vapor and the oxygen that burns as opposed to the solid that burns? Because I got to get the molecules together, and if I have a surface, there's only so many gases oxygen atoms so it can hit that surface. If I mix them together, even in a diffuse way, I have a lot more contacts between oxygen. I mean, I do burn on the surface, but the fraction of burning on the surface is so small compared to the fraction that's burning when these things mix in the gas phase. I mean, the molecules can get together if they're completely integrated in the gas phase rather than they're separated at the interface, right? So, I mean, you know, combustion actually sort of makes sense. You know, stop to think about what's happening in, in detail. So in any case, it turns out MAP has a higher carbon ratio than pro, uh, propane does. It turns out somewhere in your notes, you've got something that gives you the carbon to hydrogen ratio versus the, what we call the adiabatic flame temperature. What's the maximum temperature if you had no inerts? Perfectly stoichiometric, pure oxygen burning it. What's the maximum temperature you can get in that gas? It's called the adiabatic flame temperature. No heat loss, everything combusted. You can calculate it. 
thermodynamically. And it turns out if you go to, uh, you look at the carbon hydrogen ratio and you go from zero to, to one, well, one is just pure carbon, right? Um, I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry, not, not pure carbon. One is acetylene, C2H2, right? Um, zero is pure <coughs> hydrogen. There we go. And I can have other things in here. 0.25 is methane, CH4. Propane is over here at 0.75. Or no, that's not propane, that's math. Okay. And propane would be back down here somewhere. If you plot all this, you go from like 2800 degrees centigrade for pure hydrogen flame to an assembling flame of around 3100 degrees centigrade. There's only a 300 degree difference in all your hydrocarbon fuels. I mean, just think about it. On this plot, I've now plotted all the hydrocarbons I can think of somewhere in here. Going from methane, which has the highest concentration of hydrogen, to acetylene, which has the lowest concentrations of hydrogen. And if I want, I can keep going out there further, but the, I can't, the plot doesn't keep working if I go out further. Then I go to carbon. And pure carbon, I can't remember what the 80 bat flame temperature of pure carbon is, but it's like 3300 or something to see. Okay. But that's carbon vapor. In any case, um, because MAP is over here, it turns out there's about a 230 degree difference centigrade between MAP and propane. Uh, and we can demonstrate that. And you can see that even with that small difference, not a big difference in temperature, that you can get a significant difference in heating rate. First of all, I just turn on a propane flame. That propane flame makes a certain amount of noise, right? Now, if I turn on the matte flame, you expect to be louder or softer in noise? Louder, because it's going to be burning hotter and faster, right? Goes as T squared. Okay. So you can actually, there is a slight difference in sound, but there's a more dramatic difference in, in heating rate. If I take a piece of steel and I put it right into flame, You see that the, the map is heating faster and hotter. It's glowing more red than the propane. If I take it up here, it'll become more dramatic. Let me take it out for a second. hotter and faster than the propane, okay? Even though the maximum flame temperature is, it, this is not pure oxygen, okay? This is mixing with air. It is a pre-mixed flame. Where's the mixing chamber? It's the tube right here. How's the air get in? See the holes right here? Okay, I have a little, if I look carefully in here, um, there's a little hole, a little, very small hole, that the gas comes out and creates a venturi, which sucks the air in. So the mixing chamber is really down in here, but it all mixes through here. And there are actually baffles in here, if you were to x-ray this, or actually, even if you don't x-ray it, if you were to unscrew the tip. And look, I can't see it in this one. Uh, I have some others, that, other torches that you can actually see. There are baffles in there to make it swirl as it's flowing through there. This is actually an Inconel tube. That little tube costs about 20 bucks a foot, okay? Which is why this little, this little igniter costs 50 bucks. And they're handy, right? <laughs> the light up the room, okay? So you can, you can look at the igniter and you can see the little, the little hole down in there um, that the gas pulls through in the mixing chamber that's in there, okay? Um, the point is, Acetylene or MAP. Acetylene actually is further out than MAP. Well, actually, I said there was a 230 degree difference. I'm not sure it's 230. I have to go back and look at it. It's actually the 230 degree difference I was thinking of between these two. Okay? 
But anyway, just a couple of hundred degree burning difference um, can make a significant difference in these things. And that's just a simple air premix flame, not oxygen. Uh, if, the, if I was burning pure oxygen, there is a 230 degree difference between these two. This one's 2870 and this is 3100. Uh, so far as an 80 bag flame temperature. So I don't know, you have a pot somewhere. Maybe I'll find a spot. Pot. <coughs> this handout shows hydrogen at about 2750 and shows acetylene at about 3100. It shows propadiene. This is the pot, it's not very easy to see. But propadiene's right, so this is MAP, that's acetylene, hydrogen's down there, ethane is here, propylene is there, propane is down here, butane, so you can basically draw a plot through a through all of these. And it's really just the enthalpy of burning carbon plus uh, mixed with, with uh, hydrogen and different gases. Well, how big a difference does all this make in things? Um, if you go, the people who sell you MAP gas, will tell you that it's inherently safer than acetylene. Um, anybody know what the main problems with acetylene are? Acetylene's not the safest thing to have around the house. I have some in my garage, but not the house. <laughs> well, first of all, acetylene has a very wide range of flammability limits. Um, acetylene will burn between like 3% and 90% concentration in air. It can be explosive. The lower, lower flammable limit and the upper flammable limit, sometimes called lower explosive and upper explosive, although flammable and explosive are not exactly the same. But I think acetylene is 3.4% to, to 90% or something like that. Extremely wide range. Natural gas, on the other hand, has a flammability limit of 5 to 15% concentration. So we don't get a lot of explosions in people's homes because you've got to get to at least a 5% concentration or you can't sustain the, the rapid propagation of this flame. If you get more than 15%, you've got too much fuel around and you can't support it. It doesn't generate enough heat. But because acetylene generates so much heat, it has very wide explosive limits. Turns out MAP also has fairly wide explosive limits. It may be between 10% and 80%. It's not as broad as three and a half to, to 90, but it's still pretty broad. So that's not the full explanation. Uh, the other part of the explanation uh, of why the two are different is that acetylene ignites under pressure, self-ignites. It goes boom at a, something above 60 psi. So you've seen propane, <coughs> you've seen acetylene cylinders, looks like this, right? This is called a B cylinder. This is half of a B cylinder of acetylene. Um, it's been cut away, and I'll pass it around in a second. Now, you have to understand how acetylene was uh, discovered. It was discovered by some little scientist uh, uh, in some down in the coastal area of North Carolina. I was looking for the book. I can't find my book that tells the whole story. It's Jefferson's Welding Encyclopedia, but I think it was somewhere down near Monroe, North Carolina, or something. And this guy had been working around, this is the 1880s or 1890s. Uh, and electric arcs had just become available. If you, ever, you first had, this was in the 1880s, you first had people building power supplies to generate electricity. That's when arc welding also started. Because before that, Sir Humphrey Davy had tried starting arcs when he first uh, developed, uh, uh, when he first, he was the guy who discovered arcs and, and named them arcs uh, in like 1805 to 1807. And one of the first things he did was try to weld, but no one had a real power supply to, to generate arcs. Um, until the 1870s, people used to put together banks of laden jars. Laden jars are just, you know, liquid capacitors, you know, in jars. And they just put together these banks of capacitors and try to weld with that. In the 1880s, people learned, Edison and Westinghouse taught people how to build generators. Um, and once you had generators, now you had a source of electricity to make arc. So this guy was doing a little chemistry, uh, and he took limestone, which is just calcium oxide, plus carbon, and he put it in a little arc furnace, and he got something called calcium carbide, plus, uh, let's see, 
Passing card by the bus. See you all. Right. That's balance. No, it's not balance, but you know, cards. Okay? But that's the way you make calcium carbide, which does not exist in nature for a reason you'll soon, soon understand. Um, so, calcium carbide is a solid, and it, I can't remember what the, the, the book for the book this morning, but now, what he was trying to synthesize, but it didn't work, so he had to get rid of it, so he went down to the local brook, and he threw some of this in the brook, but for some, some reason there was a source of ignition there, and the brook caught on fire. Well, it turns out calcium carbide with water goes to calcium hydroxide, which ought to have two of those, plus acetylene. So when he threw the calcium carbide in the water, he generated acetylene. For some reason, there was a flame nearby, and that it was acetylene coming off. They burned. He thought, oh, this is curious. He never saw the brook burn before. He had to live in Cleveland. Um, and, um, so he decided this might be useful, so he studied it some more. And it turns out, discovered that it was really acetylene. And he started something called the Prestolite Corporation, which became part of the Community Carbide Corporation, which is now part of Pax Air. Um, and so in the 1880s and 1890s, uh, they had problems because these people were driving buses or riding, you know, had horse-drawn buses back then in the cities and these they would sometimes run into drunks and things like that so they needed a, a source of light so they they basically put little lamps on the front of the buses the reason this is called a B cylinder is this B stands for bus we're using the same size cylinder they were using in the 1890s but this is the bus cylinder basically that's a nice convenient size I have a, one or two of these in my garage with oxy-settling setups, which I hardly ever use, but nonetheless. If I wanted to burn down my neighbor's house, I could. Uh, now, the problem is, if you try to pressurize acetylene more than 60 psi, it goes boom. That's not good. Well, if it's pure acetylene, then it won't ignite, right? Oh yeah, it decomposes. It's the triple bonded carbon that it's a, um, it will, not only will it ignite, uh, it can, It'll generate enough heat, you actually will start reacting with the iron and everything else, the, everything else around. I mean, it will, it will spontaneously decompose in a uh, catastrophic way, okay? Because if you do this, what do you, um, it'll spontaneously decompose and it'll find, you usually find something when it does that to react with. Um, I'm just trying to think, it doesn't really, should be generating more moles of gas. I've never done it, so I don't know. But if you read the handbooks, it basically says it uh, detonates uh, uh, above uh, about 60 psi or 100 psi, something like that. So how do you store acetylene? Well, you store it in a cylinder like this, which is filled with acetone. Turns out you dissolve the acetylene in acetone. If you go pick up a acetylene cylinder, they're fairly heavy because they're not filled with gas. They're filled with liquid acetylene. But you don't want the liquid acetylene sloshing around so you basically fill this whole thing with a ceramic, a very porous ceramic. It doesn't look like it, but this ceramic that here is 98% porous. Very, very fine pores. The acetone goes in there. You have a little felt filter up here to keep any, if you turn it upside down, you're trying to keep the acetone from just dripping out, right, of the filter. And you can dissolve a tremendous amount of acetylene in the acetone. Um, so that's the way you transport acetylene if you're not going to manufacture it yourself. If you're in a shipyard or someplace like that, or any place that uses lots of acetylene, you're going to buy calcium carbide and make your own. And all it is is a little steel hopper with a little feeder, and you have a little tank of water in the bottom of the hopper, and you drop in little particles of calcium carbide. And it generates acetylene off the top, you take acetylene off the top, and you pipe it through the shop at about 5 or 10 psi. Okay. Typically, you'll never see about more than about, I think, is it 5 PSI you're supposed to use as the typical pressure on an acetylene torch? You never, doesn't matter what size torch you're using, you never go, you always set the acetylene pressure to, a, if I remember, it's about 5 PSI. Okay. Um, and then if you want a bigger flame, just use a bigger torch and more oxygen. And then the, 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 the bigger torch will flow more acetylene um, to mix with the oxygen. Um, 
but I remember a story told me to me by the uh, largest shipyard in the country, which will remain nameless, but it is in uh, southern, southeastern part of Virginia. Uh, <laughs> and uh, one of the guys there was telling me that he was a he's a welding engineer. He was in the shop. He was in the welding engineer uh, office, and. Uh, um, he heard the alarm go off. There was a fire somewhere in the shipyard. This is a big shipyard. If it's not your alarm, you don't have to leave. So he's not paying too much attention to it. And some other guy comes in. He says, "Oh, there's a fire down at the assembly shack." And the guy burst out of there to get to get there before the fire department did. He wanted to make sure the fire department didn't spray it with water because it's not good to spray calcium carbide with water to put out the fire. Okay. Uh, he had to explain to them how not to put out fires. Uh, because people were trained, you know, if you have a fire, you take the hoses and stuff and you spray it. But if you do that with calcium carbide, it doesn't work as well as you might think. Uh, so, okay. Uh, any other similar stories in the last two minutes? I guess I'll, I'll hold off on the difference between math and assembly. <laughs> Aluminum fires burn very hot. Uh, actually, any metal fire, you start throwing water on a metal fire where the, you basically no longer have this oxide barrier on the metal, then it is the exact same thing. Aluminum, metal, hot, in contact with water, will form aluminum oxide and hydrogen. So you actually get a secondary combustion. You actually not only get heat, you get a secondary combustion from the hydrogen that you form. So whether it's aluminum fire or titanium fire or anything else, metal fires you don't hit with water because they will typically decompose the water, form hydrogen, and you'll get secondary combustion from that. So that's, there are three classes of fire extinguishers, A, B, C, and D. I think I have one of the only two D extinguishers at MIT down in the lab. The D is for a metal fire. And basically, a D extinguisher, you're basically covering it with limestone or something like that. It's an inert powder uh, in the extinguisher. You're not, you're not putting water on it. And A is a paper fire, and uh, C is electrical, and D is wood or something. Anyway, so C is electrical. Most extinguishers you buy the little kid, uh, kitty uh, things for home are ABC rated. You can put them on electrical fire, you can put them on a paper fire or wood fire. There's very few people who have seen D extinguishers, okay? But D extinguishers, it's not foam, it's basically a powder, an inert powder that just smothers and coats the thing to stop the reaction. Okay. Uh, we have class tomorrow, but I won't be here. You can watch, if you, you don't have to come to class tomorrow, but uh, Chris taped this uh, discussion of the engineers uh, of the World Trade Center. Uh, and so uh, you can watch that if you like. I will be here Friday and we'll go over uh, the difference between assembling a map and other things. Okay.